Today's scripture comes from Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. You may be seated. Thank you. As you're seated, let me pray for us. Father, we are grateful as we always are that we can gather together in the name of your son, Jesus, and that you have promised us by your spirit, you are present with us. We thank you for the promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And we ask you that today as we have a look at Proverbs, as we work through this text and many others, Lord, that you would help us to apply it to our hearts, that we would live our lives in a way that would glorify you in everything that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, my name is Brett. I want to add my welcome to Kendra's. We are in a series of messages through the book of Proverbs, and today we are talking about what Proverbs says about money. Um, I was getting ready to preach this week, and I was talking with one of the other pastors, and uh, he was saying, you know, basically looking at me, wondering why I was struggling putting this together. He was saying, haven't you preached about this before? And it was sort of like a rhetorical question because he just imagined I had. And then I started to go through my notes over the last 10 years. And this is the first time I've ever preached one whole sermon on money, which is kind of weird because it's a pretty big topic, uh, pretty important in our lives. But um, our practice is to work through books of the Bible verse by verse. And so anytime something comes up, we'll address it in that context. But this is the first time, it was my surprise, that I had uh, written a sermon specifically on the topic of money. It's actually, that was true of the parenting sermon that I did uh, a, a month ago or whatever that was. I'd never preached one whole sermon on parenting as well. So yeah, there's some surprises for us. So basically, I'm sorry for that. We're going to fix that today. And we're going to look at what Proverbs says on the topic of money. And the good news is if you want more information, you want to go more in depth on this, maybe you want some frameworks that'll be helpful for you. We have a four-week course coming up in the fall led by two very wise, very godly people who are going to be teaching the biblical view of money and how you can handle it in every area of your life. And so that's going to be coming. If you're interested in it, watch for the announcement. That'll be released. And then uh, we'll be having that course in the fall. Now, as we get at this today, we're going to be talking about our posture toward wealth. We're going to be talking about what we do with our wealth and wisely building wealth. Our posture toward wealth, what we do with our wealth, and wisely building wealth. And before I get to these three points in specific, what I want to do is give you a bit of an orientation of what Proverbs says overall on the topic of money. I want to try and just create, I don't know, a paradigm of thought for us that we can use as we go into these three specific points moving on. And so in some ways, what we're going to look at today is what Proverbs says about the complexity of economics. It's, it's a complex topic. It's not as simple as maybe we'd like to think it is. And so we want to see what Proverbs has to say about that. In Proverbs, we find that we have the rich and the poor. Proverbs is honest about the economic situations people find themselves in. Proverbs talks about the rich and the poor. But the rich and the poor, like on a, a bit of a continuum of wealth, are not necessarily moral categories. And I want to make that really clear. Proverbs is going to make that clear, but but this is not a moral category, the rich and the poor. Rich doesn't necessarily equal good, and rich doesn't necessarily equal bad. Poor doesn't necessarily equal good, and poor doesn't necessarily equal bad. And that's why this topic is complex. In Proverbs, the rich and the poor are not moral categories. This is why you need to qualify it with some other correlative term. And, and now I shared this quote a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about faith and work. And I want to share it again with you uh, because I think it's very helpful. Bruce Waltke said, wisdom in Proverbs and its correlative term righteousness is all about being rightly related to God, to other human beings, to all creatures, and to the environment. Wisdom in Proverbs needs the correlative term righteousness because wisdom without qualification is a morally neutral term. And as I studied the whole of Proverbs this week, looking at the rich and the poor and money and wealth and everything that is encompassed in this topic, found that it's very helpful to apply the same rubric, to apply the same grid to it. I think the same thing is true with regard to wealth. We need something else to help us define whether it's good or bad. 
The rich and the poor in Proverbs are morally neutral until you start to define how they have become either rich or poor. And then you have to look at what the rich and the poor actually do with what they have, either out of their richness and their wealth or their poverty. So we have to look at how they got it or how they didn't get it, how they got into the situation they're in. Or, and then we also have to look at what you do from the position that you find yourself in right now. So, so Proverbs is complex. This is going to be more of an informational sermon than an inspirational sermon. I just want to say that up front, right? That's why we got the AC cranked up. I'm going to keep it nice and cool in here so nobody nods off while we're in the midst of it. A lot of info. If there's inspiration, it's not because I intended it. Let's say it that way. What I want to do with this layer, uh, or, or, or with the rich and the poor on this grid, I want to layer the righteous and the wicked on it. We've been talking about this as we've gone through Proverbs as well. And to quote Bruce Waltke one more time, he says, the wicked advantage themselves by disadvantaging others, but the righteous disadvantage themselves to advantage others. This is, I think, a very helpful quote as you're looking at any topic in the book of Proverbs. The rich, or the, the wicked, pardon me, advantage themselves by disadvantaging others, but the righteous disadvantage themselves to the advantage of others. This is a helpful framework. So we're going to lay that on top of our rich and poor. So we're going to have rich and poor, and now we've got righteous and wicked. And the contrast between the righteous and the wicked in the book of Proverbs, it comes down to the person's relationship with God and with the community at large and the interaction with that community. It's about the way you interact with one another as a community. But all of that flows from the knowledge that your life belongs entirely to God, including your money. And this helps us look at the complexity of all of the different economic situations that people find themselves in kind of three-dimensionally. Right? We can't look at a at, at situation where we just take a snapshot of someone's life and then make a judgment based upon that. Which means you can't look at the supercar driving down Main Street and assume that that person must be a criminal. That's a $350,000 car, that person must be corrupt. You can't assume that. Nor can you assume that the person who's sitting outside the coffee shop begging for money is somehow lazy and refuses to work. You just can't make that assumption. But we fall prey to sort of a two-dimensional view of the economic situations that people find themselves in. But there are contours and complexities to these economic situations that we see around us every day. And Proverbs is going to help us to see what they look like. It is never as simple as the narrative that your particular choice in the 24-7 news that you take in wants it to be. It doesn't matter which news source you're looking at. There is an agenda, and there's something behind it. And I'm just telling you, wealth and poverty are not as simple as anyone is going to make it. You have to look at it to see the nuances and the contours of the situations that are all around us on a daily basis. So in an effort to work through some of that complexity and try and show you what I think Proverbs is teaching us, I just want to build out this grid. When you add righteousness and the wicked to the grid with the rich and the poor, it starts to take shape. You'll end up with the righteous rich, and you'll end up with the righteous poor. You'll end up with the wicked rich, and you'll end up with the wicked poor. And the question you need to ask yourself is not how much or how little they have in terms of assigning like a moral standing to people based on whether or not they're rich or poor. The question you need to ask is, how did they get there? Proverbs has that level of nuance. My belief is that if you took this grid and what I'm going to be building out later on it, and you read through the entirety of Proverbs from chapter 1 to 31, you're going to find that this is true. Proverbs is kind of hard to teach on this kind of thing because Proverbs is teaching with comparison and contrast and there's all these different... Uh, ways that it's structured. And so you can't just take a verse and go, this is all here. You have to take the entirety of it. You can't just take one verse and say, this must be what it's saying about wealth. You have to take the entirety of the book and learn what God's wisdom with our wealth really, really looks like. So let's talk about these four categories. Let's start with the righteous poor. Proverbs 13, 23. It says, the fallow ground of the poor would yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice. What this is saying is that the fields of the poor are fertile and produce enough food for them, but it can be stolen from them through injustice and oppression. Poverty, because of injustice, is not bad. It's an unfortunate situation to be in, but it does not make the impoverished person somehow inherently bad. Poverty because of injustice is not bad. It is no disgrace to be poor because of the situation that you are in due to the injustice of the wicked. Think about the millions of people who have had to leave everything due to persecution. 
Would we look at them and say, well, they've got nothing. They must not be good. That's nonsense. It's too wooden. It's too two-dimensional. You can't make that kind of judgment call based on a snapshot. Think about the people who've had to flee war and famine and government corruption, and they've had to leave their country or their region. Maybe they had to leave their city and go somewhere else, but they've left with nothing. They end up showing up in a different country, different city, different region, destitute and impoverished. Due to no fault of their own, it is oppression and injustice that has located them there. We're not called to judge the poor as though they've done something wrong in and of themselves. Again, the real world is more complex than that. It could be that the poor you see are categorically the righteous poor and that the reasons for their poverty are tough to discern from a distance. The village that I grew up in in central Alberta is filled with the rich and the poor. Generations of abuse and broken homes, generations of addiction and relational dysfunction create a particular environment where it is not easy as a young person to thrive. And if that's your point of origin, if that's where you begin from, it's very difficult to shift out of poverty in one generation. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult. And I would say apart from the intervening grace of God, it is difficult to break out of that kind of system of poverty. The origin story of some of the poverty that we witness in our neighborhood here and that we witness around the city and really everywhere in the world, some of the origin story of that poverty is the deadbeat dad who abandons his family. And then a single mom works her fingers to the bone to provide for her children. It's righteous. She's done nothing wrong. She has suffered an injustice and is dealing with the consequences of it. Proverbs says, poverty because of injustice is not bad. Proverbs also says, poverty because of laziness is. The wicked poor. Proverbs 10, verse 4 and 5. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. Again, this is all over Proverbs. I talked about the the life of what Proverbs calls the sluggard a couple of weeks ago when I talked about our faith and our work, doing our jobs in light of what we believe. We talked about the sluggard. The sluggard can't get a project started. The sluggard can't get a project completed. And the sluggard always has an excuse on why one of those two things is what's happening to them. What ends up happening is the sluggard is in poverty. Can't get a project started, can't get it completed, and always has an excuse why not. Because of those three, the sluggard is in poverty. See, laziness in Proverbs is actually a moral problem. If you think about it, how can you have a righteous life where you disadvantage yourself to the advantage of others if all you're ever doing is looking for the easiest way out for you? You can't serve the rest of the people around you if you are the categorical sluggard that Proverbs is teaching about. So it's too simple to look at the poor and assume that you know why they've ended up that way. Are some victims? Yes. Are some lazy? Yes. And in Christ, we're called to love and serve both without qualification, but we are not called to serve them without working to remedy the root cause of their poverty, whether that be injustice or laziness. We serve and love all people, but we can help work on the root causes of some of the situations they find themselves in. It's going to require relationship, getting to know people, not having a two-dimensional view of their situation, but actually a fully formed, all-encompassing view of how they got there, what's going on, and how you can help. What about the rich? Proverbs talks about the rich, the righteous rich. Proverbs says a lot about this. Chapter 10, verse 22. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Some of you just deeply offended at that. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. And you're like, well, explain that away in non-financial terms, please. I will not, because that's not what it says. That is exactly what it says. Proverbs has nothing bad to say about being wealthy in general because wealth in and of itself can be the product of God's blessing and your diligent work. 21.5 says the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. 12.27, whoever is slothful will not roast his game. Now you remember, I told you, that's wild animals that have been caught. You city dwellers don't know this. He roasts his game, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. The slothful will not even roast his game. The righteous rich 
Righteous rich is not the only kind of rich that you can find in Proverbs. We have to look at the wicked rich. 1527, whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates bribes will live. 16.8, better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. 28.6, better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. Now, I've limited myself to two or three on each of these. Well, maybe one of them I didn't, but all of the rest of them, I'm limiting myself. There's, this is all over the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is honest about wealth. It can come from diligence or it can come from unjust gain and injustice and crookedness. Now think for a second. We talked about the righteous poor, those who have suffered injustice. Said that their fields were fertile and the crops would provide, but someone comes in and sweeps it away in injustice. Who do you think is doing the injustice? It's the wicked rich. They're getting rich through crooked and unjust gain. Proverbs is filled with warnings against acting wickedly or selfishly in relation to wealth. So let's fill in our grid a little bit further. The righteous rich. They have gained their wealth through wisdom and diligence. The righteous poor are those who have suffered injustice that has located them in the situation that they are in. The wicked rich have become wealthy through unjust gain, And the wicked poor, Proverbs says, are the sluggard or lazy. So here's what Proverbs is saying. Poverty because of injustice is not bad. Poverty because of laziness is. Wealth because of diligent work is not bad. Wealth because of dishonest gain is. That's the economic framework that Proverbs gives us with regard to wealth. But the problem with the grid on the screen is that you maybe find it difficult to map you know, the, the intent and the motives of the human heart onto it. So we want to get to the heart of it. Point one, our posture toward wealth. That was just my introduction. And I just want to be clear that my introduction does not count against my preaching minutes. <laughs> that's, that's how this works around here. I don't know if you know that. Introductions don't count. You just get a freebie. And then you start your points. And then the clock starts. Our posture toward wealth. This is the only prayer in the book of Proverbs, but it's a good one. It comes from Proverbs 30. You heard it read earlier, 7 through 9. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Proverbs speaks about the posture of our heart toward wealth and material possessions, and I don't think any proverb says it better than this that is on the screen. It's a prayer where he says, give me not poverty lest I steal and sin against you, and give me not wealth lest I forget you and deny you. That's a good prayer. This is the wisdom of God. The the wisdom of God helps us acknowledge that both poverty and riches can be a dangerous temptation. You go, well, what what is he advocating for here? Give me neither riches nor poverty. That sounds a lot like the middle class. Now, if you go back in history, the middle class and the rise of the middle class is actually based upon a lot of Christian ethics that were integrated into Western society before everybody decided to start denying God. But that's another topic and we don't have time for it. Is this saying that going month to month and paying your bills and always having enough and never having a lack, is that wisdom? You're like, shoot. I've been trying to get out of this month to month thing for a very long time. I didn't realize that it's the wise posture that the Bible is perhaps advocating for here. The wisdom of God. Something we should consider. Because if our heart craves wealth, we need to ask ourselves why. 
On the one hand, poverty can lead a person to steal in an effort to get out of poverty. We don't want poverty. And on the other hand, wealth can lead a person to deny God. We don't want to be tempted to deny God. Proverbs 10, 18.10 uh, 18, says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. See, when we are in trouble, when we are in need, we can always run to God. We know that that's the invitation we've received. He is the strong tower and we can run to him and be safe. But is that where you run? When trials come, when worries and doubts, you know, you're confronted with them, is that where you run? Look at what verse 11 says. Put it beside verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs to it and is safe. A rich man's wealth is his strong city. And like a high wall in his imagination. (laughs) When the righteous man is in trouble, he runs to God. But when the rich man is in trouble, this says he runs to his wealth. Okay, When you're stressed out, freaked out, worried, filled with anxiety and fearful about the future, do you open the banking app on your phone or do you open your Bible? Somebody opens the banking app on his phone. That's okay, he's my friend. He just wanted a spit take with that. That's good. That's the most inspiration in this whole sermon. Can your wealth give you mental and emotional security? Does your wealth comfort you in times of affliction? I have never sat down with somebody who just received the terminal diagnosis and sat down with them to pray with them, and they go, no, 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 I'm good. Don't worry about it. I'm rich. (laughs) Fine. No one has ever responded like that. Because it won't comfort you. It's only a strong city in your imagination. The Lord is truly a strong tower, but in the mind of the rich, in his imagination, his wealth is his security. So Christ City, do you trust God? Or do you trust the balance sheet on your investments? None of us does this perfectly. There are so many things that we can put our trust in. It's just a reminder to call you back to that which you can really trust. When the storms of life come for you, and unfortunately I have the task of telling you that 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 is true, they will come for you. When the storms of life come for you, your wealth is a terrible anchor to put your ultimate trust in. When the storms of life come, that anchor will not hold. Why? Well, one of the reasons is that you might not be able to hang on to it anyways. Proverbs 23, 4 says, Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it is gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings and flying like an eagle toward heaven. It it can vaporize. All of you who are into crypto and NFTs know this. (laughs) I'm doing so well, I'm doing so well. 12 minutes later, I have nothing. That's, That's crazy. I hope you didn't trust in it. Don't place your trust in that which can be taken from you. That's my point. If you trust in money, you will never have enough to feel comfortable. If you trust in money. If you trust in money, you're never going to see a balance at the bottom of your spreadsheet that will make you feel comfortable. I've never sat down with somebody who trusts in money who thinks they have enough. If you trust in God, you know that that will endure through suffering and trials and all the bad news that this life can bring us. Because the true wealth and inheritance we have in Christ transcends the material wealth that we can acquire in a few decades of work here and now. When Christ is the anchor of your soul, when he is what holds you in the midst of the storm, you can have peace no matter what the waves come. No matter what waves are washing over you, if Christ is your anchor, he will hold you. Don't place your trust in that which can be taken from you. It's not wrong to have wealth. Do not mishear me. 
It's wrong to place your ultimate trust in it. That's why this prayer from Proverbs 30 is so wise. This prayer is about contentment. The opposite of contentment is craving. Craving. Proverbs 10.2, treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. One scholar said this craving here is the unrestrained, uncontrolled, greedy appetite of those who are unwilling to live within the restraints of God's order. The unrestrained, uncontrolled, greedy appetite of those who refuse to live according to the will of God. Just need more. Crave a little more. The craving for more and more and more is what marks the life of what Proverbs calls the wicked. The life of the wicked is marked by craving for selfish gain that comes at the cost of others. It's an advantaging of self and a disadvantaging of others. And this is contrasted when we look at the life of the righteous person. The wicked crave and will never be satisfied, but the righteous are content. This is similar to what Paul writes in the New Testament to Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. See, craving and contentment might give shape to the posture of our hearts. It's not about the bank balance. It's about the posture of your heart. Are you content or do you crave and crave and crave? But that heart posture is invisible in a certain sense. That heart posture is only revealed in our actions. It's only revealed in what we do with what we have. So first point, our posture toward wealth. Second point, what we do with our wealth. What we do with our wealth. This is why what we do with our wealth matters. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Okay, this is not a transactional vending machine text, right? Where you're like, if I give this much, I will get this much. And I will turn God into a vending machine for my enjoyment. Just so you know, he knows the motive of your heart. And that's not how it works. Okay, that's not how generosity works. It's talking about becoming the kind of person who honors the Lord with what they have, and it's an assurance that God will continue to trust you with abundance. Honor the Lord with your wealth. It's actually a covenantal framework that, that would take much time to unpack from the Old Testament. And we see the way that Christ draws that into our lives. See how we're transformed by the gospel and we come to trust God with everything we have. And if we continue to honor him with everything that we have, we, we can be assured of this. There's a bit of a theme. I'm going to show five verses on this. Five, not three. I think I promised three earlier, but five. 11.24 says, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. 14.21 says, whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. 14.31, whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. 19.17, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. 28.27, says, whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. Do you see the theme? There's a way to honor the Lord with what you have. See, we're talking about what you do with what you have. And there are three things you can do with your money. You can give it, you can save and invest it, and you can spend it. 
And the course that we're going to have this fall is going to go into, you know, in depth on these things. But whether you're talking about giving or saving or spending, the way you do it will be marked by either generosity or greed. When you're talking about giving or saving or spending, the way you do it will be marked with either generosity or greed. One is self-centered and the other is shaped by being transformed as you have entered into relationship with God. In Proverbs, the wicked are marked by their greed. And I want to say your generosity or greed are not defined by your level of wealth. Some of the people who I've met who I think are the most greedy in their heart, and the conversations that I've had with them and the discipleship that we've entered into with this, you, you can have nothing and be very greedy. You're always looking at somebody else to do that work. But everything you have is consumed by you. See, if you're not faithful to give with little, you'll never give with much. You, 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 you have to understand, generosity and greed are not defined by the level of your wealth. They're defined by the posture of your heart and then your actions, not the amount. The righteous are generous people. You can be rich and greedy, and you can be poor and greedy. You can be rich and generous, and you can be poor and generous. Jesus pointed this out to his disciples when he called attention to the poor woman who dropped a couple of pennies into the offering. Her trust was in God, and her generosity meant that she had, he gave all that she had. In Luke 21, verse 1, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two copper coins. And he said, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. So generosity and greed are not marked by the amount, but by the state of your heart. Paul the Apostle gave instructions for the rich in 1 Timothy chapter 6, further down in the chapter than what I read before in verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides for us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Okay, I said it is not wrong to have wealth. It's wrong to place your ultimate trust in it. It's not wrong to have wealth, but what you do with your wealth matters. And what you do with your wealth reveals the state of your heart. The first thing, our posture toward wealth. The second thing, what we do with our wealth. And third, wisely building wealth. Wisely building wealth. I want to leave you with a list of five things that Proverbs says about wisely building your wealth. Four come from what I've already shared, and so they're going to be repeating. I'm going to be repeating them. And then the, the last one is something that I'm adding. But what I think would be helpful is if you took this list and then you read through Proverbs and you look at Proverbs in light of this list. And if you take that grid and read Proverbs in light of that grid, I think you'll see that the fullness of Proverbs is really painting a particular picture about the complexity of our economics. And this is helpful for us as we think about what it means to build wealth going forward. Number one, honor God. Proverbs 3.9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. That's the first thing. Honor God. Number two, be generous. 11.24, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. And you said, Brett, this is supposed to be wisdom for building wealth. And the first two talk about honoring God and giving my money away. That is not a great way to build wealth. What are you talking about? That is only true if in your head you do not exist in the economy of God. Honoring the Lord with what you have is honoring the Lord with what he's given you. It's a great way to build wealth. Being generous with what you have is the call on your life as a follower of Jesus. So honoring the Lord with your wealth and being generous with what you have is literally the foundation of Christian wealth building. Number three, work diligently. Proverbs 10, 4 says, A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. Four, aim for contentment. It's again our prayer. 
Two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. And number five, be patient. Proverbs 13, 11. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Patience. Now, let me have a word to, this is going to, I'm going to sound, I'm going to sound very old as I start talking about this. Young people, I have enough gray in my beard to, to say things like young people. My fear is that when I say the youth these days, I start to sound like my dad, which is not my goal. It's not my goal. Young people. You're 22, 23 years old, you graduate from university, you get your first job, and then you complain that you're not making $150,000 a year, and you complain that they don't see your true value, and that you're going to go out and you're going to work in the gig economy because maybe that'll be more rewarding to you. Hey, patience. The reality is you pretty much stink at your job. Okay, you've not learned how, there's going to be a lot of investment into you before there's going to be a return on that investment. Don't Be impatient with your wealth gathering, your wealth accumulation. Honor the Lord with what you have now. If that's little, honor him with it. Be generous with what you have now. If that's little, be generous. Work hard. Aim for contentment. But be patient. It's going to take you a while to figure this out. We live in the world where we hear the sensationalized stories of this person started this company and then boom, 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 they're a billionaire. And you're like, why can't I have that? It's like, you know what? The normal story is I got a job and I got promoted because I was the one who didn't quit. Hey, that's the best way to get promoted. Just don't quit. <laughs> okay, this is, this is wisdom. Everybody around you go, they're not treating us very well here. They're treating us like newbies because you're a newbie. And then, and, then you, and then they all quit. They go somewhere else. They go, I'm going to work in the gig economy. I'm going to do my own stuff. Until you realize finding work for yourself 52 weeks a year is way harder than working for somebody else and may not be as fruitful, but that's another story. Okay. You'll get promoted because you're the only one left on that level. And then they hire all the new people and you became senior. (laughs) Just be patient. Work hard. Be the best employee you can. If you have the ability to start your own company, by all means do it. But be patient. You have a lot to learn. It says wealth gained hastily will dwindle. But whoever gathers little by little, 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 little by little will increase it. Okay, he, he, this is it. This is the wisdom of God. Spend less than you make every month and you will be wealthy. I know that's not sensational. And I know you think that might not yield you the $5 million a year that you're really hoping to earn. But is that realistic? For some of you, perhaps it is. But for the rest of us, we need to build wealth in a wisdom, with wisdom. Little by little, it'll increase. Proverbs gives us an honest, comprehensive view of wealth and poverty. It gives us an honest, comprehensive view of contentment and generosity. And one of the great temptations that we have still is to put our ultimate trust in the wrong inheritance. Proverbs is helping us with the here and now on how to handle ourselves day by day, but it would be a mistake for me to talk about all of this and miss out on the true and better inheritance that we have in Christ. And so let me take you to 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for us, salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Yes, we've talked about what Proverbs has to say about wealth, but please do not pretend that this is not where our wealth truly is. Let's stand and respond.